Salutations, Undertale community. It is I, Grim, official Caralor expert. Today I come before you to claim that one of the most popular theories in the Undertale community is wrong. It is not correct. By the angel. Okay, I don't really know how to start this video. Typically with these video essay things, I'm trying to shed light on something I've come up with, but here I'm trying to disprove something other people believe in. Something a lot of other people believe in. I've actually been thinking about doing a video on Narakara for a while now, but I was just never sure if I should even bother. I mean, technically, by making this video, I'm dedicating an entire discussion to a theory that I don't even think is true and that I honestly just personally dislike. But then I realized something. This gives me another excuse to talk about Kara. Maybe this isn't so bad after all. So first of all, there's something I wanted to get out of the way at the beginning of this video. I've actually already made my own video about Kara before, and while I still think it's a decent video, I definitely think I've gotten better at this whole thing since then. So while this video will mainly be focusing on debunking Nera Kara, you can also think of this as a de facto remake of that video. I don't really disagree with any of the points I make in that video, I just think it's rushed and there are some pretty important things I forgot to go over. So I was thinking about how to approach doing this whole debunking thing, and I believe I've come up with a plan for this video. A three-step plan, in fact. Step 1. Explain everything we know about Kara. Now, some of you may just want me to get straight to the main point of this video, but you have to realize that Undertale has been out for over 8 years now. I figured I could do this to make sure everyone is up to speed, or at the very least refresh everyone's memory on the topic. There may be people watching this who don't even know what narrator Kara theory is, which brings us to the next step. Step 2. Explain Nera Kara theory. This step is straightforward enough, so let's move on. Step 3. Complete eradication. I will burn Nera Kara to the ground. I will cut deeper and deeper until nothing remains but ash and broken dreams. I will bring you to the true absolute height of Undertale fairy crafting. I will actually get this video started, alright, let's go. So real quick, let's start with Kara's origin story. I'm just going to try to get through this part as quickly as possible because there's a lot to cover. First of all, at the beginning of every playthrough of Undertale, you name Kara. However, if you input the name Kara, the game labels it the true name, so that's why we use this name when discussing the character. There is also no canon pronunciation of Kara, but since it's likely short for character, this is how I choose to pronounce it. Kara was the first human to fall into the underground and was discovered by Azriel. Azriel helped the wounded Kara back home and they were adopted into the Dreamer family. Kara and Azriel grew close, so close that they started filming funny TikToks together. There is no video for some reason, there must be something wrong with their iPad. Anyways, Azriel mentions that the two of them tried to make better scotch pie for Asgore, but when reading a recipe, they mistook cups of butter for butter cups, as in the flour that's basically just poison. Asgore got terribly sick, but Kara just laughed it off, showing that they may be a little unhinged. According to Azriel, Kara also hated humanity, which is likely connected to the reason that they chose to climb a mountain that said to make people disappear, and then uh, Asgore gave Kara some epic speeches, or that might have only been when Kara was on their deathbed, actually. But either way, Kara came up with a plan to free monster kind. First, they had Azriel fetch them some good old poisonous flowers, and they just ate them. This made it appear to the rest of the underground that Kara suddenly grew fatally ill. But really, the plan was that when Kara died, Azriel would absorb their soul and use it across the barrier. Now, something I always like to point out this part of the story is that if Kara wanted, rather than sacrificing himself, they could have murdered Azriel and taken his soul instead to enact their plan, but even if they were a little unhinged, they didn't do that. I think, like pretty much every other character in Undertale, Kara is morally gray. They did some questionable things during their time with the Dreamer family, but in their own way they still seem to genuinely care about Asriel, even if this plan was never actually something that Asriel wanted from Kara. Now, something else interesting I mentioned about Kara was their love for plant life. While Kara was bedridden, they asked to see the flowers from their village on the surface, but sadly there was nothing the monsters could do. Even though Kara literally brought this upon themselves, I can't help but feel bad for them. At the end of the day, they're still just a suffering child. Anyways, there's a lot of interesting connections between Kara and flowers. In the genocide run, you can see this drawing of a flower was drawn by Kara. In this present, you also get a worn dagger, perfect for cutting plants and vines. And there's also... Yeah. 
I find all this interesting because it reminds me of Asgore, and there's going to be a lot I have to say in this video about Kara's relationship with Asgore. Now, when Kara died, to the two siblings' surprise, control over the body was now split. Kara picked up their own empty body. That's... kinda haunting to think about. Imagine holding your own dead body. Anyways, Kara brought their own body to the surface so it could rest with the flowers they loved. Then, the humans saw Asriel holding a body assumed Asriel killed the child and attacked. Kara wanted Asriel to go through with the plan and use their full power to wipe out the humans so they could then take the souls and use them to free monster kind, but Asriel couldn't go through with it and he ran back home with Kara's body and died in the garden. Then, Asgore got really mad and decided to redeclare war on humanity, which he would come to regret doing for the rest of his life. And then Toriel got really mad, and she just went to the basement and took Kara's body all the way back to the ruins for a proper burial. <laughs> she really... She really left and took the kids, huh? I'm so sorry, that might actually be the worst joke I've ever made. So Toriel carried Kara... Uh, So Toriel buried Kara under the flowers, which is fitting, because they love flowers, and also flowers killed them, and also their brother is a flower, that's pretty cool, I guess. Then some more humans fell into the underground and die, and then Undertale Yellow happens, except it probably doesn't for multiple reasons, but you should still play it though, it's a great fan game, shout out to Undertale Yellow. And then finally Frisk falls into the underground, we can finally talk about the actual main narrative of the game. Yippee. Alright, let's get real for a moment. I am obviously aware that a lot of people watching this believe in the Nerikara theory. I mean, you are the target audience. The whole point of this video is me trying to convince you that Nerikara theory is wrong. However, for this part of the video, I ask that you please temporarily forget that Nerikara theory even exists. We are going to go through the events of the game and focus on what these events tell us about Kara. Do not worry, I promise I will get to Nerikara theory. I just want to make sure we go over everything else related to the character first. So, at the very beginning of Undertale, Frisk lands on Kara's grave. And this is important because Kara seems to be brought back to life in some way through the body of Frisk. Now, in my original video about Kara, I presented my own mini-theory on how this may have happened. Kara's coffin has a red soul on it, meaning they must have had the same soul type as Frisk. My theory was Frisk having the same soul type must have somehow triggered Kara's determination and brought them back. However, now I think that's actually wrong because of something Kara says in the genocide ending. At first, I was so confused. Her plan had failed, hadn't it? Why was I brought back to life? You. With your guidance, I realized the purpose of my reincarnation power. Together, we eradicated the enemy and became strong. Holy cow, I did not go over his dialogue nearly as much as I should have in my first Kara video. So, first things first, we need to establish what exactly is happening in this scene. The Absolute has been reached, and the world now lies on the edge of Erasure, and now Kara, who shouldn't even have their own body, is talking to someone. The question is who Kara is actually talking to. Immediately, there are two interpretations that people will think of. Either Kara is talking to Frisk, or Kara is talking directly to the player. However, while I myself am hesitant to ever say the answer to any mystery in the Undertale universe is the player, I don't think this scene makes any sense whatsoever if Kara is talking to Frisk. Throughout the entire genocide route, Kara seems to have complete control over Frisk. When Frisk looks in the mirror, the narration changes to, It's me. Kara. Flowey says, you and your stolen soul. When Flowey is then talking to Kara in New Home, Flowey tells Kara to stop making a creepy face, which is exactly how Asriel describes it in the first recording the two siblings made together. This is all Kara. There is no Frisk involved here, so how would the lines, with your guidance, and together we eradicated the enemy and became strong, make any sense if it's being said to Frisk? The only logical explanation I can come up with to explain this dialogue is that Kara is talking directly to the player. We as the player made the choice to go out of our way to find and kill every single monster we could, and that is what led us to this point. That is what Kara is referring to as guidance. Together, we as the player, and Kara as the in-universe character, eradicated the enemy and became strong. 
Kara was not forced to do anything. They certainly weren't forced to do anything by Frisk, or even the player for that matter. This is something they, as a character, were willing to do alongside us. We only provide some much needed guidance in the right direction. Now, how does this explain how Kara came back to life? Well, it's right there. Why was I brought back to life? You. We brought them back. Kara's dialogue even seems to double down on this if you do a second genocide run. Kara will now describe themselves as the demon that comes when people call its name. We as the player call Kara's name at the beginning of every playthrough of Undertale. It doesn't matter where, it doesn't matter when, time after time, they will appear. So um, yeah, that's just most of the genocide route explained, so now what's Kara's deal on the other routes of the game? Well, now that we're done literally going over the very first room in the game, let's talk about the second room. Here we have Flowey, who we know as Azriel. When we meet Flowey, some music plays. This is Flowey's theme, titled Your Best Friend. Do you know who Azriel's best friend is? It's Kara. Wonder what that could mean. Now we move on to the third room and there's a save point. Frisk approaches it, yada yada, determination, and then Kara's name appears in the save menu. Hmm. Where have I seen a character use a save point but have a completely different name appear in the save file? Oh yeah! Delta Rune. Chris seems to be under the control of another entity, whether it be the player or an in-universe character, or both I guess. And that entity who has control over Chris's body seems to also have control over the save system. So if Kara has control over the save system in Undertale, then that would logically mean they also have control over Frisk themselves. This is further supported by this is literally just what is happening in Genocide Route, there is no debate there. But what's really crazy about this is that this means this must also be happening in the pacifist and neutral runs. It's just much more subtle here. I'll now go over everything else that hints at Kara's presence outside the Genocide Route. So first of all, Kara's name is in the menu. Why even put Kara's name in the menu if we are playing as Frisk? Then when you die in Undertale, you see Kara's memories of Asgore saying that they need to stay determined for the future of humans and monsters. Then after finding Toriel, if you go back to bed, you have a dream about Asgore, who Frisk hasn't even met at this point. Next in Waterfall, when Undyne slices his bridge in half, we have yet another dream about when Asriel and Kara first met. Why would Frisk have this memory? Then in the somewhat secret ending where Asgore, instead of being killed by Flowey, pulls a Kara himself, before he dies, he says you remind him of Kara. Real subtle. There are even multiple lines within the narration that- oh, wait a moment, I was uh, getting a little ahead of myself there. We'll have to come back to that later. Finally, the real bombshell. The thing that I'm most upset myself for neglecting to talk about in my original Kara video. So what Flowey says after you finish the pacifist route. So here we encounter a similar problem that we had when looking at the genocide ending. We need to figure out what exactly is even happening here, and that means understanding who exactly Flowey is talking to. So Flowey shows up, begging someone not to reset everything that's happened. However, once again, Flowey is not talking to Frisk. How do we know? One line. Let Frisk live their life. That is blatant confirmation that Flowey is not talking to Frisk. So who is he asking not to reset? See you later, Kara. There you go. And now, dear viewer, I ask you a question. What is the point? Where does Kara fit into Undertale's world and story? What do they represent? Well, we know Kara now lacks her own body to use within this world, so they have to take control of Frisk to experience it. They also possess the ability to save and load, so long as they stay determined and don't choose to quit. We also name them, directly connecting them to... The player. For some reason, Kara seems to be the only one who directly talks to... The player. That's the answer. Kara represents the player. Judging from everything we've gone over, that seems to be the intent of the author. Kara represents the player. They are like a mirror. It is now time to talk about the narrator Kara theory. Before we get started, there is one more small thing I need to explain. 
In Undertale, two types of narration are used throughout the narrative. Second person narration is the most common. This is when the narrator says things like, you ate the item, you equipped armor, you stinky. Rarely, however, aka solely in the genocide route, you will get first person narration, which I imagine most people are already familiar with. This is when the narrator says, I dropped the item, my bed, it's me, Kara. With that clear to everyone watching, we may now dive into the Kara theory. So this mirror, it's got different narration and different routes of the game. Normally in the ruins it says, it's you. Then in New Home you get, despite everything, it's still you. Then after finding Azrael and Pacifist, if you go back to the mirror you get, still just you, Frisk. And finally in the genocide route you get, it's me, Kara. Wait a second, still just you, Frisk? It's me, Kara? The second person narration is describing Frisk, while the first person narration is describing Kara. And that's how Kara started. So there are two main claims being made in the Kara theory. The first claim is that all first person narration is Kara, and I have no issue with this. I don't think anyone has any issue with this. You look in the mirror, and the narrator literally says, It's me, Kara. You go in Azriel and Kara's room, and you get my bed, and my drawing. That all seems pretty blatant. Now for the second claim. All second person narration is actually Kara narrating the world to Frisk, and also Kara just really likes D&D apparently. Fair enough. So, as I briefly mentioned earlier, there is second person narration that seems to be connected to Kara. Andrew Cunningham actually made a great video discussing the nature of narration in Deltarune, and he even linked a post that he seems adamant in people looking at. Now, while I don't agree with Andrew on every point he makes, I still like his content, and I'm confident that this link will provide the best argument you can make in favor of a... Uh... Oh. Well, that's unfortunate. So at this point, I was unsure of what to do. There is one other post I could find about Narakara theory, but judging from Andrew's video, there's a lot more to go over, and if there's more evidence, then I want to be able to go over it in this video. I tried looking into it a bit more and stumbled across Dort seemingly trying to figure out the very same thing, and well, this honestly just makes me feel sad. So I decided to take a moment here to say, please don't harass anyone in this video or anyone who supports this theory. In fact, please just don't harass anyone in general. At the end of the day, we all like the same thing and we'll have our own interpretations of it, and there's nothing wrong with wanting to voice your own interpretations. Anyways, my interpretation is the right one and I need everyone to know that, so I'm going to do what I never imagined I would do. I am going to save Narakara Theory. I'm going to salvage as much as I can from Andrew's video. I feel like I somehow just forced Andrew Cunningham into a de facto collab with me. This is really bizarre. I must save Narakara theory before I can destroy it. Oh no. So from this part of the table of contents as briefly shown in Andrew's video, we can see a few of the main points in this theory. And here is one big point that the theory makes. The narrator isn't all-knowing. The primary example of this being the water sausage. In Toriel's home, you can come across this plant that Daenerys seems to be unsure about. Then, if you look at this book that explains that the plant is called a water sausage, you can then look at the plant again, and now the narrator applies this knowledge. The narrator learned, therefore proving they are not completely omnipotent. Other examples of this are the monster candy in Shiren. When you inspect the monster candy, the narrator describes it as having a non-licorice flavor. However, once you eat it, the narrator seems distraught to realize that the candy does, in fact, have a licorice flavor. This shows that the narrator's initial assessment was wrong. Then, when finding Shiren, when you check her, the narrator describes her as tone deaf. However, if you check her again after humming with her, the narrator corrects itself by saying she's a talented singer when she has a little help. Another piece of evidence is that the narrator is capable of changing depending on your actions. There's a bag of dog food in Alfie's lab, and if you inspect it in a pacifist run, it is described as half full. 
When you inspect it in a neutral run, however, it is described as half empty, showing that the narrator has gone from being optimistic to pessimistic. Leave it to Undertale fans to somehow turn a bag of dog food into a concrete piece of evidence. Then when find Washua, you can make jokes that seem to reference Kara. Two kids playing in a muddy flower garden refers to Kara and Asriel. A kid sleeping in the soil references how Kara's body is currently buried in soil. And a kid eating pie references how Toriel, Kara's mother, makes pie. Then, when anything related to the Dreamers comes up, the narrator gets noticeably silent. Finally, when you look at this bed in the genocide route, Kara describes it as, my bed. When you look at it in any other route, however, the narrator describes it as a comfortable bed, and says if you lay here, you may never get back up. Kara likely died in this bed. And I think that's all the major points. All the major points that I can find anyways, so without further ado... None of this actually proves that Kara is the narrator, and now I will explain why. First, let's take a quick look at another game that uses second-person narration, Amori. Don't worry, I won't spoil anything in this video. So in this room, you can look at a photo, and when you do, the narrator is oddly vague about it. It describes the person in the photograph as someone familiar, but for some reason, it doesn't actually identify who this person is. This is because the main character, Amori, is actively choosing not to acknowledge who is actually in this photo. Technically, there is no reason why the narrator couldn't just tell us, the player, who is in the photo, but to go along with the character in the narrative, the narrator describes the photo in this way. The narrator is an in-universe character purposefully keeping the truth from us, it is simply reflecting what Amori thinks and feels as a character. Now with this in mind, let's look back at all the points the narrator theory makes. First of all, the narrator not being all-knowing. This can easily be explained as the narrator reflecting that our protagonist is not all-knowing. If the protagonist doesn't know something, then the narrator can reflect that through its own narration. Same explanation for the dog food bag. If our character has become pessimistic, it just makes sense to change the narration to reflect that. Then with Washua, there are so many ways you can interpret this. First of all, this could literally just be foreshadowing. The entire narrative of Undertale revolves around Kara and Asriel, so sneaking some hints towards them in narration isn't much of a stretch. In fact, the game also does something similar in Toriel's house. In her house, you can find a single dead flower on a drawer, and when you inspect the drawer, the narrator says there are flower seeds and broken crayons inside. The flower seeds represent Azriel because he became a flower, and the crayons represent Kara because they like to draw. This doesn't directly disprove anything in the Narakara theory, but I just wanted to point this out to get the point across that narration that references Kara doesn't automatically prove that Kara is the narrator. The other way you can interpret these jokes of Washua is that Kara, who is present within Frisk, is making these jokes himself. It makes sense that if Kara made a joke, they may call back the things they themselves experienced. This is important because under this interpretation, the narrator is describing something Kara did in second person, which destroys the whole foundation of this theory, since according to Narakara theory, the narrator only describes Frisk's actions in second person. Next is the narrator going silent. Once again, this can just be the narration being used to convey what the protagonist is currently feeling. It does not prove that Kara is the narrator. Finally, there is Kara's deathbed. This narration is clearly a callback to how Kara died, but once again this doesn't actually prove anything in favor of Narakara. If we are playing as Kara, who is now making their way through the underground using Frisk as their vessel, then of course the narration is going to reference Kara, because Kara is the true protagonist of Undertale. From the ashes of one theory, I present to you my own, which I will now dub, True Protagonist Theory. This theory... Well, it's literally everything I presented at the beginning of the video. I believe in all routes, Kara has control over both the save system as well as Frisk. I actually believe this works somewhat similarly to how Chris is being controlled in Deltarune. 
We can make Chris do pretty much anything we want, but they still have enough freedom to do things like let people know their name is Chris, just like how Chris tells Azriel their name at the end of the pacifist realm. So yeah, that's my Kara theory. What do I do now? Oh yeah, I'm not actually done debunking Narakara theory. That was just me going over why the supporting evidence is weak. I still need to go over the counter evidence. So the first piece of counter evidence is something that Andrew himself actually brought up in his video about Deltarune's narration. There are multiple times when a narrator can see the thoughts and feelings of characters other than Frisk or Kara. Furthermore, there's even a time when you take a monster candy into ruins, where a narrator straight up tells you what button to push in order to open your menu. This shows the narrator can actually be all-knowing if it's convenient to the narrative. There's also this narration of Snowdrake's mom, and I'm gonna be honest, this just feels like narration being creepy for the sake of being creepy. I really feel this way about most of Undertale's narration. To me, it doesn't feel like a consistent character, it just feels like it's there to make a few jokes and help the player better interpret the world around them, and in a few cases to provide foreshadowing, but nothing really screams that this is a character itself talking until the first person narration comes up in the genocide route. Speaking of which, if you thought the points I made about the Washua jokes were bad for this theory, wait until I show you the absolute mess that is the genocide route's narration. As I said, the main foundation of this theory is essentially this mirror, and that it uses second-person narration to describe Frisk and first-person to describe Kara. The idea here is that since Kara is supposedly the narrator, once Kara takes control over Frisk in a genocide route, they now narrate in first-person because they have control over Frisk's body. With this logic, all second-person narration should now change to first-person like with the mirror, since all narration is Kara. Most of the narration in the genocide route, however, is still second person. Now, maybe Toby was just too lazy to change most of the narration. Although, let's be honest, if Toby really wanted Kara to be the narrator, I'm absolutely certain he would have changed most of the narration to convey this idea. Let's just say he was lazy for the sake of argument, though. Why are there multiple instances of genocide-specific narration that still uses second person? Just earlier, Kara said, I unlocked the chain, so now why would they say, you feel like you're going to have a bad time? It's inconsistent and the theory does not address this problem whatsoever. Kara does not represent a narrator, Kara represents the player. Well, that was a lot. Now I'd like to take a moment to take one last moment to level with you. Narakara is a very popular theory, and to a certain extent that popularity has annoyed me. Not in the sense that I'm mad that my own theories aren't as popular, but because sometimes I feel like I see this theory pop up wherever I go and it annoys me because personally, I just think it's wrong. However, while it's true that its popularity is part of the reason it annoys me, I think there's another, more personal reason why it bothers me. I first played Undertale when I was in middle school, and back then, I myself believed in Narakara. Why does this debunk actually come with an entire villain origin story attached? Anyways, the reason I wanted to go on this mini tangent is that I wanted to say, I know what it's like to follow or even come up with a theory that you believe is so strong that you don't even want to give genuine thought to what other people have to say. I myself was like that for quite a while with Narakara. In fact, back then, I remember looking at the second-person narration in Genocide Route and just thinking, eh, whatever, the mirror basically proves it. Now, however, I look back on that version of me and wonder, what the hell was I thinking? Now, you're still allowed to come to your own conclusions, and I'm not trying to say everyone who disagrees with me is wrong and too immature to admit it, but I just wanted to say that I think for me, Realizing Narakara wasn't nearly as strong of a theory as I thought it was taught me another way to look at art as a whole. Rather than just looking at the cold hard evidence, something equally important when analyzing a narrative or a character is to look at what the artist is trying to get across. Look at all the aspects of the character and genuinely ask yourself, what are they trying to do with this character? What are they trying to say? What is it that Toby Fox wants us to see? 
when we look at Kara? What is the point? I think when we look at Kara, we are meant to see ourselves, because despite everything, it's still you. That would have been a really good way to end the video, but something just occurred to me. I basically just criticized the Naricare theory for not addressing the counter evidence, and even said that I look back on myself with contempt for not thinking about the counter evidence. But I haven't really thought much about the counter evidence for my own theory that I just presented in this video, so I figured if I want to make sure I've changed, I should go over it. Those who ignore history are doomed to repeat it and all that. So, the main foundation of true protagonist theory is that Kara represents the player, and that Kara actually has some level of control over Frisk in all routes of the game. There are three main pieces of counter evidence I can think of for this theory that I'd like to go over. First of all is when Frisk tells Azrael their name at the end of the pacifist route. Now, I already presented the idea that this could be similar to how Chris has some level of freedom when we make choices in Deltarune. However, the problem with this argument is that as of now, for anyone in the future, we only had two chapters of Deltarune when this video was made, by the way. Chris hasn't actually had to introduce himself to anyone. Deltarune is mostly made up of characters who already know Chris personally, which is the main reason they know Chris's name. For all we know, we could actually force Chris to tell someone their name is Sans. Frisk telling Azrael their name can therefore be counter evidence that Kara does not have full control over Frisk in the pacifist route. However, I think there's an air plausible way you can look at this scene. Let's look back at the dog food bag. The narration here tells us that the protagonist can change depending on what path they're on. If the pacifist route is Kara at their most optimistic, then perhaps Kara simply allows Frisk to introduce themselves to Azriel. There are actually multiple things that support this interpretation. First of all is what Flowey says when asking Kara not to reset. He says, let Frisk live their life. At the end of the pacifist route, I think this is exactly what Kara is doing. They are choosing to let them live their life. If Kara chooses to reset, however, Frisk once again lands on Kara's grave, and once again Kara takes control over them. With a little bit of player shenanigans, of course. The other things that suggest Kara actually gives Frisk more freedom in the pacifist route is, well, the entirety of the genocide route. In the genocide route, Kara's presence feels like a complete hostile takeover. This is Kara at their most sadistic, so it makes sense they would have little care for Frisk here. Genocide Kara sees Frisk as nothing more than a means to an end. Now for the second piece of counter evidence. A large part of my argument is that Kara represents the player, however there is something Kara says that completely contradicts this. If you do a second genocide run, Kara says this. HP, attack, defense, gold, exp, love. Every time a number increases, that feeling, that's me, Kara. But you and I are not the same, are we? This soul resonates with a strange feeling. There is a reason you continue to recreate this world. There is a reason you continue to destroy it. You... You are racked with a perverted sentimentality. Now, something important to remember about the play I'm trying to make is that I'm not saying that Kara is literally the player. Just like how it doesn't make sense for Kara to describe themselves in second person in the genocide route, it also wouldn't make sense for Kara to be talking directly to us if they literally are us. My argument is just that Kara represents the player. Think about Chris, for example. You could easily say that Chris represents a video game protagonist, because the main part of the narrative is that someone is taking control over them. Would you say that's the only aspect to their character, though? No, of course not. 
Chris has their own drives and motives outside of just representing a protagonist. I think the same applies to Kara. They act as a mirror to us, but they are still a different person with their own drives and motives. Now, something else related to this that I also wanted to mention is that while I've mostly been arguing that Kara represents a player, you can actually also make an argument that Kara represents a video game protagonist, like Chris does. At the beginning of every playthrough, we name Kara, just like how in a lot of RPGs you get to name the main protagonist. Kara referring to us as providing guidance can also be seen as a reference to how, as a player, we essentially give guidance to the protagonists of the games we play. To be honest, I actually don't think this interpretation is wrong. In fact, I actually think both interpretations are correct. Try to follow along with me here, this might sound a bit confusing. Sorry I went over why I think Kara represents a player. Them taking control over Frisk mirrors how a player takes control over a protagonist. Them having the ability to save and load also obviously mirrors what we as a player can do. However, us naming them mirrors the protagonists in other games we also get to name and them saying we provide guidance points them following us like how a protagonist follows the player's will. This is going to sound a bit ridiculous to say out loud, but I think Kara actually just represents both. When you look at the dynamic between Kara and Frisk, Kara acts as the player, while Frisk acts as the protagonist. And when you look at Kara and the player, Kara acts as the protagonist, and we act as the player. After thinking about it, I've decided to slightly change my theory from Kara represents the player, to Kara represents both player and protagonist. I've determined that the original version of the theory was wrong. No biggie. Now for the third and what I think is the strongest piece of counter evidence against my theory. In the true lab, Flowey calls you and seems to talk with Azriel's voice. The narrator describes it as a voice you've never heard before. If the narrator is referring to what Kara thinks and does, then this seems really odd since surely Hera would recognize Azriel. Well, there are a few ways I can explain this. First of all, it's possible the narration could show not only what Hera thinks and feels, but also what Frisk does. At the end of the pacifist route, the narrator specifically refers to Frisk in second person. However, throughout the genocide route, the narrator refers to Hera in second person. This shows that the second person narration could potentially be referring to either one of them throughout the pacifists and neutral routes. If the narrator just happens to be referring to Frisk here, then it's not as strange, but I admit that isn't a super strong argument. I think I thought of a better argument though. Let's say that the narrator is referring to Frisk in second person. Well, in that case, his narration would still be weird. Just earlier in the True Lab, Frisk listened to recordings made by Azriel. Therefore, Frisk should recognize Azriel's voice. Even though they sound very similar, the tone of Azriel's voice here and the tone here sound different. If this difference is enough that Frisk, who just heard the voice in recording, doesn't recognize it, then I think it also makes sense that Kara wouldn't recognize it. And that's all the counter evidence I could think of for a true protagonist theory. There might be more counter evidence that I haven't thought of. But I'm sure it can't be worse than, well, all this. Yeah. You either die serving the Kara Defense Squad, or live long enough to debunk Nera Kara.